Hello, Paul Pounds. So today we're going to talk about Sean Hudson. Now, there's a couple of things I need to say about this video. Uh, it's impossible to talk about Sean Hudson and his work without exploring some themes that people may find offensive. There's ideas he explores in his books that people will find offensive. So, if you're quite a sensitive viewer, in all seriousness, I just want to say that this video will contain a discussion of some of Sean Hudson's ideas, which are harsh uh, and desperately unpleasant for a lot of people. So... I want to put that warning out there as a genuine thing. This video will also contain, I think, some strong language because I'm going to have so I've got some interviews with Sean Hudson that I'm using. Um, and bless him, he never curbs his language. If you're uh, part of Sean Hudson's legion huge legion of fans and you've not been to my channel before and watched any of my videos hello and welcome um this isn't gonna be a sitting and slagging him off do i like sean hudson's books no i don't do i continually read uh, buy and read sean hudson's books yeah whenever they come up and I find them, I always buy them, and I always read them. Why? <laughs> I shall be trying to answer that question as we go. But first, let's have a word from today's sponsor. Woolies have cut 35p off a hundred of their hottest cassettes. Queen. Helen Reddy. Barry White. Gladys Knight and the Pip. Status quo. Rod Stewart. Join the cassette browsers at Woolies. Get 35p off. James Lost. Johnny Mathis. Bob Dylan. Fatback Band. 10cc. Manuel. And every one of a hundred of Woolies' hottest tapes. That's the wonder of good old Woolies. Look, Look for the money off sticker. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> So in this video, I'm looking at Sean Hudson's books published by Star between 1982 and 1986. So going up to uh, Death Day. After Death Day with Victims, they changed the style. Um, and I, I think they make a nice, a nice set. They all have a similar font. They all have similar cover designs, as you'll see as we go. Um, and I'm not including his movie novelization of Terminator because it's not a, an original novel. And I'm not including Chainsaw Terror, um, partly because that was never published, I think, under the name Sean Hudson. That was Nick Blake. And I also think the whole Chainsaw Terror thing needs a video on its own i need to kind of sit and discuss that as a as a separate thing so starbucks didn't publish the first uh sean hudson book to come out that was hamlin in 1982 that published the skull um which we may look at in a future video so the first one that um star published in 1982 was slugs um capitalizing on the uh nature out of control creatures gone wild and eating us kind of thing um and unlike right so i think the skull is a pretty good it's a pretty good book and although he went for it a little bit, I think it was at Star that Sean Hudson really went for it. Now, if you haven't read any Sean Hudson books, he is extreme. Um, 
and I've discussed books on this channel that are pretty extreme but I think for especially for 80s and 90s authors I think Sean Hudson is the most extreme horror writer now there are I have to I just have to say there are similarities between Sean Hudson and another 80s horror writer. Mike stared in disbelief as his hands fell off. From them rose millions of tiny maggots. Maggots? Maggots. 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 All over the floor of the post office in Leytonstar. But I'm not going to dwell on that. As much as I adore Garth Marenghi, I don't think it would be fair on Sean Hudson to do just like a video that pokes fun at him. So, yeah, slugs. They uh, were slugs that fed on human flesh. Um, bigger than usual slugs. Scoffing people down. Like there's no tomorrow. I don't know why in the slugs book, because because poison and slug pellets didn't work. They just scoffed them, and it made them more furious. I don't know why nobody got like a pot of salt, and just chucked it about. But hindsight's a powerful survival tool in horror, isn't it? So yeah, it's, it's Sean Hudson set up set the bar with slugs in terms of gore um this isn't a criticism this is an observation a lot of sean hudson's books are uh that they follow a similar theme so you get quite a, an exciting runaround you get the protagonists dashing from A to B to try and sort out whatever problem Sean Hudson has conjured up. And then that's punctuated by uh, scenes and sometimes entire chapters of extreme violence and gore and strangely non-erotic sex scenes that just make you feel a little bit uncomfortable and slugs is no stranger to that whole runaround thing you get uh, the protagonist dash back and forth trying to convince people that the slugs are killer slugs uh whilst other people have been eaten now another thing that sean hudson does is we get a quick build up if someone's going to die they normally get like a couple of pages build up and then they die so a couple of pages backstory a couple of pages to explain what kind of a person they are and then they die horribly and that does happen a lot in slugs i think that was something that he kind of established in slugs and then continued in his later books okay so I did warn you this is going to get a little bit strange and unpleasant. So in 1983 we got Spawn. Um, Spawn is without too many spoilers is about a pyromaniac who uh, kind of ends up killing his sibling and mum in a, a fire and is in a, a a mental institution which closes down and he gets a job uh, in a hospital in the uh, in working in the incinerator and he one of his, one of his duties is to Ferry, I don't know if hospitals work like this. Okay, 
trigger warning from here on in. I'm not going to say it again. Trigger warnings. One of his jobs is to ferry the uh, remaining fetuses from abortions to the incinerator. Um, ultimately, some of these fetuses become almost like telepathic zombies and do he that they, they they get they get this chap to do their bidding um i'm trying to talk about these books without spoilers i'm going to i'm talking about the books and then we're going to the second part of the video i think is going to be exploring some of the some of the themes and how Sean Hudson presents horror then in 1984, Starr published Erebus, um, which is about uh, kind of science gone mad, uh, like a cattle feed that makes the cattle bigger and beefier and better, but they go insane and so does everybody. Well, it kind of turns everybody in the small English farming community where this is set into like a uh, vampire slash zombies um, and it all goes it all goes crazy with lots of violence and bloodshed shadows from 1985 uh, really looks at the idea of uh, would you be able to kill someone by astral projection, essentially? Um, and again, it's it's that back and forth run around um, as malevolence is revealed and the protagonists have to try and fix it or survive it's it's normally one or the other now i'm not there's nothing wrong with that as a narrative device and if sean hudson is happy using that as a narrative device then that's brilliant i want authors to use narrative devices that are that they feel comfortable with that's how they want to tell their story so something that somebody goes back to it's not like time and time again over different novels that isn't a criticism that's how he writes there's a lot of authors i like that do similar things each time there's a lot of bands i like that you know a lot of their albums are the same there's a lot of film directors i like who use the same approach because it works and god damn it worked for sean hudson so then, uh, 1985 also saw the release of Breeding Ground, the second Slugs novel. Um, it's quite similar to the first one, except now they give you a, a disease that makes you uh, break out in horrible buboes and all sorts of gruesome and ghoulish stuff. And it also turns you into a mad killer obviously and there's an unforgettable moment with slugs a middle-aged chap and a toilet <laughs> that stays with you that oh wow it stays with you then in 1986 we got relics um which out of this initial star run I think he's one of the ones I liked the most. Um, I think it's a good, solid story. Uh, the end gets a lot of criticism. But I liked the end. I thought it was a nice... Con it made a nice conclusion. Um, it's downbeat. And maybe that's why people don't like it. A lot of people... If you look on online and stuff, a lot of people say the end of Relics 
uh, the the main character acts out of character. But I think it's quite a logical reason for his actions at the end, which makes for an unpleasantly downbeat ending, which I do always like. I like, I, I love a downbeat ending. And if it ends miserably for somebody that we've enjoyed spending time with, that makes me happy. One thing I find really interesting on a personal level about relics is the character there's a character in it that organizes uh dog fights and they're horribly unpleasant like disturbingly unpleasant but it's fiction it's literally just words but i found that Actually, I, I'll be honest, I found that a bit too much. For me, for my taste. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting because it's literally just words on paper. That's what I'm reading. It's not an account of anything that actually happened. I know it's an account of things that do happen, unfortunately. But I was so disgusted and unsettled by it all I stopped I, I didn't stop reading the novel but I skipped those parts which I, I, I quite like extreme entertainment films books music I've discussed it on my channel before and to get me to kind of go shit that's a bit much I don't like that that's that's an ability that's a talent uh, in a weird way to go that far that I'm kind of sat there thinking no I don't like this is I take my hat off to him totally Anyway, then in uh, nine, also in 1986, sorry, we got uh, Death Day, which I think is another pretty good one that has a it has a good strong narrative. Um, it's about a cursed amulet that's dug up that has bizarre and unusual powers and forces people to do bizarre and unusual and murderous things. Again, it's that uh, dashing, it's the characters dashing from plot point to plot point, punctuated by mad gore, violence and sex. And I think that is, is something that Sean Hudson uses to full effect, to keep up the frenetic pace of his novels Sean Hudson's fairly unique I think in horror his approach to writing and his reasons for writing um, I think give him the edge that he's got so Sean Hudson started writing um, after he read a novel by an established author and thought this is so bad I could do better in published interviews he never seems to say what that novel was however people that friends of mine that have been to conventions he's been at he has actually said it's the sucking pit by Guy N. Smith so Sean Hudson was broke Uh, living in a flat with his partner skint and fed up read a book that he thought was rubbish and thought I could do better than this and therefore did he said in other interviews that he he isn't and never was an avid reader he preferred watching films 
And I think it's a really interesting approach to writing horror because a lot of the authors that I have read about or looked at or know, their career comes from a point of view of love and respect for the genre. Whereas Sean Hudson, his approach was, how can I get out of this shithole of a flat and provide a better life for myself and my partner? And realising that maybe he, he had to make himself stand out. Um, and by doing so, provide readers with the most extreme and unpleasant novels around he is the i think in like i said in the 80s i think he was the most extreme and i know i discuss like really gory mad horror fiction on this channel but sean hudson went to places that other authors didn't go to uh involving lots of bodily fluids uh, lo often garnering shock from uh, babies and infants being involved in the graphic violence and unpleasantness in his scenes uh, animals being abused um, lots of poop <laughs> when people die or get torn apart that's what comes out. But that's what would come out, I guess. And, and uh, also, I mean, they're babies in the microwave. Yeah, because... Well, yeah, but dead ones. I'm not that sick. No, no. They're already, I, de yeah, they're already yeah, dead, dead when dead they go babies. in. Yeah, yeah there, was a, there was a dead baby in the microwave in Victims. There was a, there was a sequence in Assassin with an undead gangster, mm. um, a prostitute and a lot of maggots, which I can't go into too much no, detail, no, that, that, obviously. That, some of the stuff um, even I wouldn't read no, it. No, it, it, yes. it is foul and disgusting, I'll yeah. admit that. But, you know, it's what people want. People like reading stuff like that. Yeah. In terms of like horror culture he's he's a bit like marmite some people like him some people really don't like him um he he manages to alienate a lot of authors i think he seems to dislike other authors quite a lot because every time you you uh interview an author, and usually I don't because they're very dull and very boring. Uh, yeah, I agree. Unlike yeah. like Sean, yeah. uh, who doesn't go to literary lunches or anything else That's like that. That's because they won't have me. I mean, yeah. I, d I don't really... F I mean, I don't fit the appearance of, of an author for a start. Uh -huh. um, somebody once said to me that their idea of an author was a 40-year-old puff in a cardigan and carpet slippers. So, no, you, you know, don't, uh, no, don't look like not. a 40-year-old puff in a uh, No, I'm, really, I'm nearly 43. Yeah. Um, and what, pray tell, is wrong with a cardigan and a pair of slippers? Mr. Hudson. I think we can all agree that an author's sexuality doesn't dictate whether or not they can write horror either. But I just don't fit in. I, I don't really play their games. I can't talk about the sort of deep Freudian subtext of having killer slugs crawling up your bog and eating you. I can't, I can't talk about, uh, you know. Yeah, but... Ultimately, Sean Hudson did it for the money. He found a winning formula. He sold millions of books. He found a winning formula that generated him money and did that time and time and time again. And again, that's not a criticism. That's just his approach to horror. Doesn't, I mean, I've, I've talked to, to loads of writers and they sort of tell me, oh, well, I, I have to get sort of inspiration and then I sit down and if it's working well, then it flows and I do that. You don't seem um, to do any of no, that. No, I have to get money and then it yes. flows. <laughs> um, basically, that's how it works. If someone says, here's yeah. an, an obscene amount of money, Sean, would you like to go and write a book? Then the muse descends with incredible speed. So is there a place for the cynical nihilism of Sean Hudson in horror? De definitely. I honestly think there is. Lovely Guy N. Smith is almost like the crypt keeper in old Tales from the Crypt EC Comics. He, in his novels, he seems to take you on a fun and ghoulish journey. 
guiding you all the way going look at this crazy nonsense that's happening but he's right there next to you all the way sean hudson kind of grabs you by the scruff of your neck and makes you look at things that are ugly and brutal and unpleasant and thoroughly disturbing i would do anybody has got a breaking point if you're pushed far enough you will do something unpleasant. It might not be something you care to face up to, but I think one of my jobs as an author is to, <laughs> is to make people face that dark side of themselves. There's a bit inside all of us that's very, very dark and we don't like to face it. I like to actually say to people, look, you've got that inside you. That can come out. Yeah. So as I said at the start of this video, do I like Sean Hudson's books? I don't. I don't like them. Will I keep buying them? Yeah, I'll keep buying them. And I'll keep reading them. Why? Because as a reader, this is very strange, isn't it? This is like self-analytical now. It's the disgust that drives me. It's, it's the disgust of what he'll do next as an author. How far will he take things? It's almost like when I was collecting, back in the 90s, when I was collecting the DPP banned videos list. It's like, is this what I'll get one? Is this going to be too much for me? Is this going to be too far? And I think it's that same mentality. If you haven't read any Sean Hudson books and this video has whetted your appetite, they are nauseatingly disgusting. Um, no subject to garner that horrific reaction is taboo. I did one called Deadhead, which was actually banned and is banned to this day um, because it had a scene with a baby that was that was used in a, um, a porno movie. But there was something that was- That was awfully sick. No, it's not. The baby was still alive for God's sake. You know, I mean, it was, there was one killed in victims. I mean, they well, usually yeah. eat and I stuff mean, like that. But, yeah. um, so that was fairly restrained for me, but uh, it was about snuff movies and that was actually banned and is still banned to this day by a leading chain of bookstores. So just be warned, gentle readers, that I'm, I'm not making myself out to be some like, oh, I can take extreme horror, like horror connoisseur. Some of them were just too unpleasant for me. But as a... As a... A figure in modern horror I think he's an interesting chap and he does some interesting things whether I like it or not is by the by to sell as many books as he sold and to keep his career going being at the forefront of bestseller lists is quite an achievement So yeah, that's Mr. Hudson. Thank you for watching guys, and I will see you lovely folks in the next video.